Today's movie is a special request from Patreon supporter Jesse Myers, who asked me to review the movie Battle Beyond the Stars. Alright, this means I get to do a Roger Corman movie and a Star Wars knockoff at the same time. Now let's see, what was the last Roger Corman movie I did on this show? Oh yeah. Ugh. Well, uh, hopefully he's a little less rapey this time. Well, we've already seen what happens when Roger Corman tries to cash in on Alien, namely a whole lot of monster rape. So now let's take a look at his attempt to get a piece of that sweet Star Wars box office magic. I mean, sure, there was already Star Crash, but that was an Italian movie that Corman distributed in America. This time, he was going to produce his own Star Wars cash-in. Actually, labeling this movie as just a Star Wars cash-in is kind of doing it a disservice, because it's really more than that. It's also a remake. Yep, the plot of Battle Beyond the Stars is actually a science fiction version of the movie The Magnificent Seven, which was itself a western remake of Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. Which is pretty appropriate, considering the plot of Star Wars A New Hope was partly based on another Kurosawa movie. Corman also decided to spend more money than usual here, giving the movie a budget of around two million dollars. Now that's not much for a major Hollywood production, but for a Roger Corman movie, that's a downright Avatar-level budget. Speaking of which, the special effects and art direction were done by none other than James Cameron, who also worked on Galaxy of Terror, another Roger Corman movie that looked like it cost more money than it actually did. This kind of makes me wish James Cameron still worked for Roger Corman. Who knows, maybe he could find a way to make Sharktopus vs. Whalewolf look good. Well, this is weird. This looks less like the beginning of a Star Wars cash-in and more like the ending of a 2001 A Space Odyssey cash-in. Battle Beyond the Stars! For those of you who thought we should have spent a little bit more money on Star Crash. No, no, no. What is this? The beginning of this movie is all wrong. That thing doesn't look like a Star Destroyer. It looks like the ship that was being chased by the Star Destroyer. I gotta give my compliments to James Cameron. For the time and budget this was made for, this is not a bad-looking movie. Then again, considering what most of the Star Wars knockoffs I've done in this show look like, my standards might be a little skewed. So the basic plot of both The Magnificent Seven and Seven Samurai involves a group of bandits who terrorize the citizens of a peaceful village, who were then forced to hire seven mercenaries to defend them. This movie is about a space pirate who comes in with his big-ass spaceship to terrorize a planet whose citizens live peacefully inside a Hieronymus Bosch painting. I am Sayor of the Malmori. I have come with my forces to conquer you. Sator is played by veteran cult movie actor John Saxon, who by the looks of it was in the middle of the Aladdin Sane phase of his career. And just what does Sator want with his lowly planet? Uh... Good question, actually. I'm not sure. They never really give a reason other than just a vague desire to conquer. Oh well, gotta get the plot of this thing going somehow, I guess. If you do not submit, your planet and all life on it will be burned to ash. In fact, even if you do submit, I'm still going to kill you. I'm kind of a dick that way. The sitcom dad High Council does not look pleased with this situation. To fight creatures of violence, you must use creatures of violence. We should hire mercenaries. We have no wealth to offer them. No, oh, I don't know. You could offer them that giant iPad you're all sitting at. They decide to send a young farm boy named Shad to go find mercenaries to fight for them, but instead of the Millennium Falcon, he takes a spaceship run by a computer called Nell. Are you there, old girl? Nobody calls me that but Zed. Sorry. This isn't going to be just another planetary joyride, you know. Huh? Sorry, I, I wasn't listening. I was staring at your spaceship tits. Uh, what were you saying? Hey, just because this movie's rated PG doesn't mean Corman can't still put nipples on a spaceship. And it looks like we've got our first space battle of the movie. Nell, what do I do? Lock in on target. Don't you mean stay on target? By the way, if any of these effect shots look familiar, it could be because Corman ended up reusing them in several different movies after this. Come on, you can't spend all that money and only use the effects in one movie. That's just a waste. Shad manages to get away, but that's only because Sador's goons needed to go tell Luke Skywalker they don't like him. I can't believe it. You got no backbone, kid. You know, I thought I did pretty well back there. I mean, you're still in one piece, aren't you? 
Sure you did. They have all the contests for running away. You'll be champion of the universe. You know, Siri really has been the same ever since they gave her SAS programming. All right, time to find ourselves a ragtag band of misfits to save our planet. Maybe there's a talking raccoon and tree monster on this space station. I don't know if you'll find any mercenaries in this place, but you might be able to get yourself a sex robot while you're here. Chad's here to see a guy called Dr. Hephaestus, who lives with his daughter Nanelia, but I don't know if he'll be much help. You are welcome, Chad of the Akira. This is uh, quite a surprise. I'll say, it looks like your daughter can build sophisticated androids. Why don't you just get her to make you a new body? Right now you look like somebody cut open a transformer. Dr. Hephaestus wants Shad to stay and mate with his daughter, but again, considering she can just make robots to cater to her every need, I don't know if there's much Shad can offer her. Better turn on the charm. Did you know that there's a form in the black galaxy whose children have no immune system till the age of five cycles? That means at the slightest trace of infection, they would just rot like fallen fruit. When they reach the age of five cycles, all the relatives gather together in a special room and they watch while the child tears and bites at this plastoid with its teeth and nails. Most of them never do develop immunities. They die shortly afterwards. Oh, God, take me now, Shad. After Shad escapes, Nanelia decides to go with him. But wait a second, you can't leave yet. You still need to have a robot orgy with Randy Quaid bot here. No weapons at all? No, uh, but I brought an analyzer. I'd like to exchange data with that thing. Might be some new wrinkles I should catch up on. Who's that? It's just Nell. Don't let the huge cans fool you. She's actually pretty smart. The two of them split up to look for more mercenaries, and I don't know who this next guy is, but I can't wait for the comment section to argue over whether his ship is offensive or history. Oh, I'm a poor cowboy. You know I've done wrong. This is Space Cowboy. But some people call him the Gangster of Love. Oh, come on, you knew I had to say that! Space Cowboy is played by George Papard. Turns out he spent some time in space before forming the A-Team. Also, I think his ship might be trying to cop a feel on Nell. So, what can Space Cowboy offer? Listen, I've done more fighting than I've seen old movies. Which is saying a lot, seeing that's all I do on long hauls. I can relate other than the fighting part, of course. Shad and Cowboy witness Sador's forces giving a demonstration of their most powerful weapon. And okay, Roger, we get it. You spent extra money on this movie. Stellar Converter. The Stellar Converter is a laser capable of totally destroying an entire planet. Hey, that's just a rehash of the Death Star. Only other Star Wars movies are allowed to keep doing that. Meanwhile, Nanelia doesn't seem to be doing too well. Not only does it look like she just entered the Acid Trip Nebula from Star Crash, but I think she's about to get eaten by another spaceship. Mmm. Yes, indeed. <laughs> a very tasty looking morsel. Ah, uh, great. She got captured by a horny slee stack. I am Kenan of the Lander Zone. And this is Kropeg, my Puna. Does that word mean Conan the Barbarian sex gimp? Because that's what it looks like. She asked Cayman to fight for them, although he doesn't seem too interested. That is until... You're heartless! You're just like Sador! Sador? Sador? Sador of the Malmody? Uh, no, Sador Smith. Uh, you're thinking of a different guy. Well, there's another recruit down. Meanwhile, either Shad's about to have a close encounter, or he just wandered into a 70s British sci-fi TV show. We have monitored your travels. You are seeking mercenaries for an adventure. We would like to participate. Look, that's great, but we're doing a Magnificent Seven remake here, and we've already got some of the slots filled. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to take all you guys. We are Nestor. We share identical consciousness. I'd be more inclined to believe that if you didn't have eyes painted on your forehead like some hippie at Burning Man. But you do have one of the best looking spaceships in the movie, so I guess we can take you. Congratulations, Shad, you got another recruit. Now let's seal the deal by drinking some blue tampon commercial liquid. As you can probably tell, most of the first half of the movie is just Shad traveling to different places to recruit the various mercenaries, but at least it looks decent while he's doing that. Some shots almost look like they could be on the cover of an old issue of Heavy Metal. And be careful, Shad, I think you may have wandered onto the Galaxy of Terror set. And believe me, you do not want any help from there. 
Ooh, a dial-a-drug machine. I hear every theater showing this movie had to have one of these installed. And come on, Shad, you can watch other Roger Corman movies later. Right now you've got mercenaries to find. The next mercenary Shad meets is Gelt, played by Robert Vaughn. Because hey, if you're gonna make a sci-fi version of The Magnificent Seven, might as well go that extra mile and cast one of the original actors from that movie. I just wish they could have gotten Charles Bronson to play the lizard guy. However, Gelt doesn't seem too keen on Shad's offer. I could buy your planet ten times over what I've gathered in this room. Plutonium. Cadmium. Beanie babies. It took until the far future, but they're finally worth something. Oh, of course Gelt ends up coming along. Robert Vaughn's practically required to be involved with anything that's a Magnificent Seven remake. Well, looks like we got most of our mercenaries together, but it feels like something's missing. We need a warrior woman character, somebody who can wear some sexy outfits like Caroline Monroe in Star Crash, and hey, there she is. I have heard of your battle with the Malmori. I wish to join you. Our last recruit is Saint X-Men, played by 80s B-movie queen Sybil Danning. She's known as a saint because it's a miracle there isn't a nip slip in this movie. Now, younger viewers may not be familiar with Sybil Danning, but if you went through puberty during the glory days of VHS and cable TV, you know who she is. I guess I shouldn't be surprised Sybil Danning's in this when even the spaceships in this movie are stacked. But for some reason, Chad doesn't seem to want her around. But I want to join. Well, we don't want you. We don't need you, and we won't have you. Oh, yes, you do need her. You need her to be front and center on the movie's poster to get guys to see this movie. All right, now that we've got all our mercenaries gathered, it's time to introduce them to each other. Where are you from, Galt? I'm from Earth. Know where that is? I was born in space. My mother was a black hole. There's someone following us. Just ignore it. Maybe she'll go away. Again, she's one of the main reasons people even remember this movie. Why are you being such a dick? The mercenaries also prove to be capable fighters by taking out one of Sador's ships. Although for some reason, Robert Vaughn always seems like he's looking at a fly buzzing around his ceiling. Beautiful. Ah, uh, I do love it when a team comes together. Now that they've made their way to the planet, it's time to figure out how to stop Sador. Right after the blind guy sneaks a peek at Sybil Danning's cleavage, that is. Like the rest of us, the Malmori ship has to lower part of its force field in order to fire. When the stellar converter is about to be activated, the ship is extremely vulnerable. So there's an exhaust port two meters wide that'll start a chain reaction that'll cause the whole thing to explode. Got it. They can't fight Sador just yet, though. First, they need to terraform Mars so Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't suffocate. And also some character development. I've got some more surprises for any visitors. What drink is that? Scotch. And soda. <laughs> Fun fact, that's also how George Papard asked to be paid for this movie. And could there be some romance blossoming between Nanelia and Shad? I've scanned information about mating. Does your species have kissing? Oh yes, we have that. That's a little advanced though. We should probably start with something simple, like blowjobs. And hey, as long as we're talking about wieners... You like it? There's no dog in this. Okay, we know it's not a real hot dog then. I see Sybil Danning got her new costume from the Barbarella Bondage line of apparel. Sador's forces begin their attack on the planet. Meanwhile, Robert Vaughn is left standing there thinking, eh, this isn't so bad. Beats the hell out of being in Teenage Caveman. So let's see how our mercenaries are in battle. I'm protector of this planet. I order you to leave it in peace. Blast her out of space. Okay, again, why is everyone in this movie so eager to get rid of Sybil Danning? All right, fellas, try not to get blown up too early. Corman needs to use these effect shots in a dozen movies after this. You know, it's kind of a shame Disney didn't buy the rights to this movie as well as Star Wars. I wouldn't mind seeing a theme park ride of this. That way you could see Nell's sweet metallic bosom in 3D. And unlike in War of the Robots, it's nice that I can actually tell who's who in this battle. By the way, did I mention Corman spent more money than usual on this movie? Gelt is the first one to get shot down, probably because he was too busy looking at that damn fly again instead of fighting. Gelt, are you alright? That remains to be seen, Chad. Have a nice fight. Spoken like a man who really wants his paycheck right now. And because George Papard was too drunk to get behind the wheel of a spaceship, he decides to stay and fight on the ground. 
And don't mess with the space cowboy, because he'll straight up shank a motherfucker. I don't know about cowboy strategies. They seem to consist of just running right up to the bad guys and shooting them. But if that doesn't work, just have these two Care Bear stare the villains to death. Oh, and if you thought Stormtroopers had bad aim, get a load of the people in this movie. Come on, they're right in front of you. How are you not hitting each other right now? Hello there, I was just wondering if there was a Lord of the Rings knockoff anyone needed me for right now. Oh, okay, never mind then. Looks like they sustained a lot of casualties. Although again, I think they probably should have sustained a lot more. And I see Robert Vaughn was contractually obligated to be in one last scene. What a place to end up. A minor planet in a third-rate galaxy. Okay, seriously, Gelt, I know you're dying, but there's no need to be a dick about it. My only regret is Superman 3. Ugh. We also learn that one of the Nesters has been captured by Sador. They better hurry up and get to the torture. This doctor still needs to create Poison Ivy in Batman and Robin. He also transplants one of Nestor's arms over to Sador, although it does have a severe case of Ninja Turtleitis. Oh, and the other Nesters can still control it. Sador, no! I can't! Stop it! Ah yes, the quit killing yourself assassination method. Oh, they can't kill John Saxon yet. He still hasn't been in Nightmare on Elm Street. Well, you still haven't defeated Sador, but you can still make time for a little romance. Terrific. Now I've got two babies to sit for. No. Shut up. Okay, but she's still gonna watch you two. So we now begin our climactic space battle of the movie, and I just noticed this movie seems to treat flying a spaceship the same as playing a PC game. Although refreshingly, the effects are actually less video game looking than some newer space movies. Oh, and if you expected the majority of our heroes to survive this movie, you obviously haven't seen what it's remaking. Eh, this just doesn't have the same emotional impact without a character named Porkins dying. <laughs> okay, that makes up for not having a character called Porkins. Fire on the planet. It won't fire, it has been damaged. Well, that's what you get for buying your spaceship controls at a Spencer's Gifts. But what about St. X-Men? I am St. X-Men of the Valkyrie. It's been a very enjoyable fight. Oh no, not St. X-Men! I really liked her outfits. Meanwhile, Space Cowboy finally decides to join the fight. Alright, only a few scenes left, George. You can get through this. Sadar, you son of a bitch! Here I come, this is Space Cowboy from the planet Earth! But some people call me Maurice, motherfucker! Uh, listen, Space Cowboy, I appreciate you sacrificing your life in order to save the planet, but please don't play any Bob Dylan before you die. Look, it was either that or another Steve Miller Band reference, okay? Lazuli! What is with the weird battle cries in this movie? You know what? I'm gonna put that and St. X-Men's together. Lazuli! Alright, there goes Lizard Guy, so I guess it's up to Shad to stop Sador. Maybe you can try distracting him with Nell's breasts and hit him when he's not expecting it. By the way, have I mentioned it looks like the spaceship has tits? Because it totally looks like the ship has tits. That's why I keep bringing it up. Nell gets damaged and is about to be captured by Sador's ship, but thankfully Shad has a plan. Nell, I'm gonna program you to self-destruct. Whoa, 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 I didn't agree to this. If you wanna blow yourself up, fine, but leave me out of it, you little putz. 30 seconds and counting, Zed. 29, 28, 24, 15... Did I... did I say 15? Why don't you just start from 10, Nell? Okay, 10, 2, 1. Just kidding. So Shad and Anelia escape and Nell stops Sador. I wouldn't live forever. Ah, don't worry, John, you will. In the hearts of cult movie fans everywhere. It's good that they stopped Sador, but it's too bad so many of our heroes had to die doing it. This kind of feels like if Han Solo and Chewbacca died trying to blow up the Death Star. Along with Star Crash, Battle Beyond the Stars is one of the more famous Star Wars cash-ins out there, but it also has the distinction of being one of the more well-made. The effects are actually pretty good considering the budget, and most of the characters are distinct and memorable, even if they are just playing various sci-fi movie cliches. 
Given that the movie's both a cash-in and a remake, it can sometimes get a little formulaic, but it's never boring, and most of the cast seem to be having fun with their roles. It's definitely cheesy and derivative, but it's pretty fun if you're in the right state of mind. Just don't expect anything on the level of Empire Strikes Back. And as cheesy as this movie gets, at least it doesn't have a character called General Gonad, which automatically puts it above the last Star Wars knockoff I did. Well, that's all for now. Until next time. should do. Run away? Good idea.